Thank you, Jan, for having me. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to talk in front of a more general audience. Actually, I tend to get more interesting questions from an audience like this than nephrologists, perhaps you guys think out of the box. Um, but before getting into uh, renal tubular acidosis, the granularity of it, I just wanted to uh, make the point that changes in systemic acid-base balance really is a multi-organ phenomena. Um, there are changes in the skeleton that we all know about with calcium leaching uh, when the blood pH drops. There's a whole body of literature on muscle metabolism and muscle turnover <laughs> under different acid-base conditions, especially in people over 50. Um, there's a whole literature on insulin resistance and actually insulin secretion also with changes in acid-base balance. Um, again, a large body of uh, literature on the SVR, the systemic vascular resistance, which uh, changes markedly with changes in proton concentration through nitric oxide and uh, depolarizing the endothelial cells, other pathways. Uh, uh, in addition, uh, there's a, um, a body of knowledge now. A number of investigators are working on ischemia reperfusion injury in the heart uh, with changes in acid-base balance, local transporters, uh, sodium hydrogen exchangers, uh, sodium calcium exchangers um, that may or may not alter the course of ischemia reperfusion. And since Warburg's famous studies 50, 60 years ago where he found that uh, tumors uh, secrete um, lactic acid even in the presence of ambient oxygen, there's a whole body of uh, literature now therapeutically also trying to modulate local and systemic acid-base balance in the treatment of cancer. Um, the field of acid-base chemistry uh, uh, really has been cross-fertilized by a number of basic science fields, biochemistry, chemistry, biophysics, physiology, and more recently structural biology and computer modeling, always keeping in mind uh, Darwin's fine adage, or Da Vinci's fine <coughs> adage, the noblest pleasure is the joy of understanding. And I must say the cross-fertilization has been both ways. A number of these specialties have learned from uh, what the more physiologic, biophysical, clinical acid base uh, folks have uh, discovered. A little historical uh, perspective, where does the word acid come from? Um, it actually comes from the Latin acara, which means sour, and it's interesting, in the last two years, Lyman's group has shown that the sour taste that we experience in our mouth is due to a proton current. The channel hasn't been found yet in those particular uh, taste buds, but it is due to a proton current, so the Romans were pretty astute. And alkaline is a, comes from the word alkali, which means roast in a pan. It's an Arabic term, alkali. Um, and it comes from actually making soap. They used to take plants and roast them. Plants have potassium bicarbonate. They would mix them with calcium hydroxide and animal fat to make soap. So that's where the word alkali comes from. Physical chemistry really took off in the 1700s with Lavoisier, who was one of the discoverers of oxygen. He actually thought it was an acid uh, and used the Greek word oxyan, which means acid in Greek. Turned out not to be the case. And that's really continued up to the present time. Clinical acid-based chemistry took off in the 1920s and really had its heyday in the 60s, starting with Van Slyke, then up to Schwartz and Raumann, who actually characterized all the clinical acid-based disorders, metabolic acidosis, respiratory acidosis, and the like. That was in the 1960s. The diseases that alter acid-based phenomenology was really, um, really came about during the period of the 40s to the 80s. Um, so not the diagnosis, but what, what, are, what are the diseases like RTA, renal failure, and those things, and how they modulate uh, the chemistry. And then fine-tuning even further down to, okay, we have the disease, now what are the transport phenomenology? Um, that really has been going on since the 90s to the present. And the game now is the atomic structure uh, of these acid-based transport proteins, which can be thought of conceptually as nan little nanomachines. Now, just if you put it all in perspective, if you assume the human genome has 20,000 genes and there's debate whether it's 20,000 or 19,000, whether you include uh, uh, RNA encoding genes, microRNA encoding genes or not, that 25% of the genes in the human genome encode uh, membrane proteins. And there are different types. There are transporters, there's receptors, there's enzymes, and there's also proteins that uh, interact with the cytoskeleton to give cells their shape. And if you look at the current data, 50% of all drugs target membrane proteins. So they're an important class of proteins, but only a handful of eukaryotic structures have been solved, and this is of great interest to pharma, 
because of the prevalence of drugs that uh, target these proteins. It's easier, obviously, to get a drug to target a membrane protein that's sitting in the cell membrane than an intracellular protein where the drug has to cross the lipid bilayer first. Uh, now, going back to our current understanding of the phenomenology was really in 1923 when, within a few months of each other, uh, Bronsted, uh, an English chem or a Belgian chemist, and Lowry, a British chemist, really almost a few months from each other, uh, came up with the concept that acids and bases are substances that are, that are capable of splitting off or taking up what they called a hydrogen ion, respectively. So uh, you have this acid, acetic acid, and it can release a hydrogen ion with acetate, and the reaction can go uh, the other way. Um, why do we have pH clinically? Where did this come from? It actually was um, a paper by Sorensen in 1909 where he said that pH uh, is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Why, why do we use pH? Um, there's a thermodynamic justification. So if you plot the pH, or if you plot the voltage on a pH electrode versus the pH, you get a linear relationship. If you put hydrogen ion concentration here, you don't get a linear relationship, and human beings love linearity. Um, so this, this was uh, one of the reasons. And the other, at least in the medical world, is MDs hate decimal places and a lot of zeros before a, a number. Um, so, you know, we don't go around in the ward saying my patient's hydrogen ion concentration is 0 0.000040 moles per liter. It's much easier to say 7.4. So there's a human psychological reason, but mainly the thermodynamic reason. Now, to put hydrogen ions in a greater context, the physicists have called the same thing protons. And it was actually Rutherford in 1920. Um, so the chemists called them hydrogen ions, physicists called them protons. Um, just to put it in a greater context, they don't, they're not just involved with acid-base phenomenology. Um, cosmic rays um, have a large contribution of protons coming from extrasolar system sources. The Large Hadron Collider is is colliding protons together. Um, that's how the Higgs was found. Uh, and now they're ch testing further uh, parts of the supersymmetry theory. Uh, we use protons therapeutically to treat cancer. And of course, MRI uh, is looking at the changing of the magnetic moment of a uh, proton um, to get the images that we all need medically. Now, even though protons in the body we think of in far, as far as acid-base phenomenology, actually most protons are bound. The vast majority are bound. And if you wanted to approach it logically, you would say that they're most important for our weight. Um, in a 70 kilo human being, 40 kilo are protons. Uh, that's 2.5 times 10 to the 28 protons. I think there's 10 to the 80th in the entire universe. Um, and actually, you could create a scale. Some people have thought of it. It tells you how many protons you have. I mean, you, if you lose a kilo, you could say you lost 6.2 times 10 to the 26 protons. It might cause you to lose a little more weight. The number is so huge. Um, free protons that we talk about in acid-base chemistry um, are really small. Look at the difference in that uh, number. It's 10 to the minus 6 protons. It's like a micromole. Um, so very, very small amount is the concept. By far, the majority are bound. Proton, the term Rutherford gave it, was actually from the Greek, which means from protos. He thought it was a fundamental particle. We now know that protons are not a fundamental particle uh, in the standard model of physics. They're made of smaller particles called quarks. They're, and they're made of two up quarks and a down quark. Each, quark, each up quark has a charge of two thirds. They're not integer charges. The down quark is minus a third. And that's why you get. Uh, your charge of plus one. A neutron actually has two down quarks and, two, and one up quark. That's why it's neutral. Water is no longer water in 2015. It's not H2O and it's not H3O plus. Uh, water is now thought to be two main forms called the eigenform and the zundel form. The eigenform is a hydronium ion surrounded by actually three water molecules and there's a hydrogen bond sharing with that central hydronium ion. Uh, the zundel uh, has a hydrogen ion in the center surrounded by two water molecules. And there's an equilibrium between the two, and there's different structures in between. But there's people that study water their whole life, so the next time you use D5W, you can think that it's a little more complex than just H2O. And there's a lot of work going on in a number of these areas, not to go into the titles. 
uh, paper we did is in the middle. There's a lot of interest in this because of atmospheric carbon dioxide accumulation and also chemistry in the ocean uh, and uh, other reasons which I won't get into such as batteries and the, and, and the like. So there's a lot of work just looking at water and how protons are transported and transferred in water. Now clinically, backing up now, um, we use this um, equality uh, called the kazira bleich equation which is really a short form of the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, but it's important clinically in that the things we use to assess a uh, clinical acid-base status uh, are the following. The hydrogen ion or proton is on the left, and there's a constant of 24 times the PCO2 over the bicarbonate. This has nothing to do with acid-base imbalance. It, this, is, this holds true um, at equilibrium in every acid-base disorder. But the nice thing about it is that it represents organ phenomenology. The lungs control the carbon dioxide concentration. Mitochondria make it at a certain rate. Lungs get rid of it at the same rate. Uh, and the bicarbonate concentration is controlled by the kidney. Now the kidney um, in mammals has several problems um, without any disease states to keep that bicarbonate constant. The first concept is that cationic and cysteine containing amino acid metabolism is an acidifying process. What do I mean by that? Uh, arginine and lysine, two cationic amino acids, when they get to the liver, actually create hydrochloric acid, which then gets into the IVC. We know that from our TPN solutions. If we put too much amino acid mixture, which contains arginine and lysine hydrochloride, will acidify the blood, so you have to have acetate um, uh, to compensate for that, which, which is converted into bicarbonate. And also cysteine and methionine amino acids are converted to sulfuric acid in the liver. So, when you eat your hamburger tonight, you have a proton load going into your IVC. Now, what happened 10,000 years ago, uh, after the last ice age, around 11,000 BC, was that humans spontaneously in a number of um, countries in the world developed the ability to have agriculture, China, Egypt, India, other places. And not, it wasn't clear why. There were a number of hypotheses. And they began to eat more plant-containing food. Now it turns out, and this has been documented in a number of studies, that the animal to plant ratio in your diet varies with the, proton, the net proton production from the diet. And um, the zero point is roughly at 60%. So if your animal to plant ratio in your diet is above 60%, your diet's going to be making protons in a net sense. Uh, the reason is that um, the plants are base producing in general, just because of the difference in amino acid content they have more glutamate and aspartate than uh, in meat. Um, and so there's a whole body of literature looking at this, people thinking that perhaps osteopenia or osteoporosis or changes in diet affect the skeleton as we age with our kidneys less ability to uh, handle these acid loads. Uh, perhaps it's contributing to a number of morbidities and the people are studying this uh, in different settings. So what happens is, assuming that there's 100 milliequivalents of hydrochloric and sulfuric acid put in a day uh, of this proton, the proton will combine with bicarbonate. It combines with other buffers too, but bicarbonate's the most prevalent to create carbon dioxide and water. No problem with the carbon dioxide, we just get rid of it. But now, if we started off with a bicarbonate of 25 and we allow just this to occur for two weeks, you can calculate the bicarbonate will be zero. So if you had nothing else happen in the body and you just had this ongoing, not excessive proton load, just dietary proton load, we would gradually decrease our bicarbonate concentration significantly. And there's a second problem that the body has to deal with, and that's the urea cycle discovered by Hans Krebs before he discovered the Krebs cycle. And the concept here is that the urea cycle is a process that acidifies the uh, hepatic venous blood. You can summarize the cycle. It's a multi-complex enzymatic cycle. Um, of two ammonium ions plus two bicarbonate ions make urea. And it, the purpose of this is to get rid of nitrogen. We can't get rid of nitrogen easily in the form of NH4+. It's very toxic, we know, from our end-stage liver patients when their blood ammonia just goes up a tiny bit. Um, they get encephalopathic and the like. So what evolved in mammals was to convert this substance into this er, ammonia, into this very soluble uh, substance, urea, which we excrete. Birds excrete uric acid, but the concept is the same all mammals have to have a way of getting rid of nitrogen, and the majority is in the form of urea. But you have to think, when the urea is made, um, it's, co it's coming from bicarbonate. So, and in fact, you can take ammonia and put it into the 
a, a liver on the table and you can gradually decrease the pH of the blood coming out just by infusing more ammonium chloride into the liver. Um, ammonium can come from other sources. I'll talk about the kidney in a bit because it has to do with the cause of metabolic acidosis in, in renal tubular acidosis. It also comes from the GI tract. And so, if, or it can come from, a, from an MD. If an MD gives ammonium chloride tablets to acidify the blood, that ammonium gets into the liver and will consume bicarbonate in the liver. The ammonium does not cause metabolic acidosis because it deprotonates. It doesn't turn into H plus NH3. It causes a metabolic acidosis because it consumes bicarbonate. The pK is 9.2. It stays as NH4 plus. It doesn't release a proton. But it's this bicarbonate consumptive process in the, in the liver forming urea. Uh, that is the cause of decreasing the pH. And that, you'll see, has partly to do with uh, renal tubular acidosis, the metabolic acidosis. Now, what evolved in all mammals is a solution for this, and that is the kidney. The kidney, and the concept is the kidney actually generates new bicarbonate. This is not bicarbonate that it reclaimed from the blood. It's actually manufacturing new bicarbonate to compensate for the proton load uh, from the liver, and it puts it into the renal vein and then the IVC. The main, there are several sources, but the main source, um, or the main location in the, ki in the kidney is the proximal tubule. It's a mitochondrial reaction, and the kidney takes this amino acid glutamine and converts it into bicarbonate. There are intermediates in between alpha-ketoglutarate. It's actually the Krebs cycle um, where the bicarbonate is generated, and it's sent into the renal vein. So that should be all well and dandy, except that this process makes ammonium as a byproduct. That's where the ammonia comes from in our urine. So there's a concept uh, that people accept now called renal ammonium partitioning, where you have this new bicarbonate generation requirement by the kidney to match the daily hepatic proton load. But in the reaction that makes bicarbonate, you're making this byproduct ammonium, which if it ever gets back to the urea cycle, is going to consume bicarbonate. So the kidney actually has developed a, a set of complicated transport systems to take that ammonium that's made in the proximal tubule and at least get half of it in the urine. It doesn't get all of it in the urine, 50 percent. And that ammonium that does get back into the blood actually gets to the renal vein and consumes bicarbonate. Now some people think this is a further modulatory process so that the kidney can actually lower the bicarbonate in the blood by sending different amounts of ammonia back to the systemic circulation. But the overall concept is there's this balance in the body. Your liver produces, let's say, 100 milliequivalents of protons a day, a day in the form of hydrochloric and sulfuric acid. The kidney generates an equivalent amount of bicarbonate. How the kidney knows what to do, nobody at this point knows. Uh, and carbon dioxide is made from that reaction, but the lungs get rid of it, so you're fine as far as the uh, carbon dioxide. So we have this equality from two different organs. Um, I, I would say, as an aside, the cause of metabolic acidosis in renal failure is that the kidney cannot generate the sufficient amount of bicarbonate from glutamine. As the GFR decreases, there's a continual decrement in the kidney's ability to take up glutamine and make new bicarbonate. And assuming you're still eating your hamburgers and the rest of the meat you're eating and making protons, you're going to gradually decrease your bicarbonate, depending on the GFR. Now, if someone with renal failure decided to eat plants and um, increase their generation of bicarbonate, their bicarbonate would be different. And in fact, we see that. People with different GFRs don't all have the same bicarbonates because of their different dietary intakes of plant-to-animal ratios that I talked about. Now, there's an additional problem that all mammals face <clears throat> in order for the kidney to keep the bicarbonate concentration at 25. Uh, and this has nothing to do with what we just talked about. It has to do with the fact that bicarbonate is freely filtered through the glomeruli. Now, the normal concentration is 25 millimoles, so mil 25 millimoles per liter. And if, assuming we have normal glomerular filtration rate, we filter about 180 liters a day uh, of fluid through all our glomeruli. And if each liter has 25 millimoles, you can do a rough calculation. That's 4.5 moles of bicarbonate are coming through all your, all your glomeruli a day. We have about a million, glomer a million of these in each kidney, so we're not talking about one. Um, but in total, they, fil they filter 4.5 moles a day of bicarbonate. 
That's roughly equal to a box of Arm & Hammer baking soda. And you can do a little calculation that if you just excreted that, in four hours your bicarbonate would be zero. So if you just excreted the bicarbonate coming through all your glomeruli and did nothing else with it, again, your bicarbonate would be zero very quickly. So what has evolved in all mammals is after the bicarbonate is filtered through the glomeruli, it's absorbed uh, in this tubule segment. This is hard to see at the back, but there's the glomerulus. This is the proximal tubule. Um, and what has evolved are transport processes. This is a, a, a scanning EM of one proximal tubule. This is the lumen. This is the blood side. These are the cells. This is the microvilli brush border. Um, bicarbonate somehow has to get from here to here, and it does because we're not excreting bicarbonate in the urine. So over the last 20 years, our lab and other labs have now created a model of how this machinery works in the proximal tube, and we have a pretty good understanding of how bicarbonate gets from having been filtered through the glomerulus to the blood side. On the so-called apical membrane of this cell, there's a protein called NHE3. It transports sodium in one direction and a proton in another direction. All mammals have this same protein. So, so the, the micro machinery that's been worked out isn't just in humans. Every mammal has come up with the same uh, scheme to absorb bicarbonate. The proton that comes out binds with filtered bicarbonate to ultimately make water and carbon dioxide. This reaction is catalyzed by a carbonic anhydrase enzyme, carbonic anhydrase 4, that's actually anchored to the outside of the tubule. It's sitting in the lumen. It's, an, it's a GPI anchor uh, bound to the membrane, but on the luminal side, and it catalyzes this reaction. It's the gaseous carbon dioxide that actually crosses the membrane. So the carbon from the bicarbonate, you don't have any bicarbonate crossing into the cell. It's all this gas that crosses. Some people think it actually goes through aquaporin-1 water channels that are also sitting on the membrane here. But the bottom line is you get the water and the carbon dioxide coming in. There's a very small gradient, but the permeability of that membrane is so high that even with the small gradient, the net flux is inward. And then you just get the opposite reaction occurring, but a different uh, carbonic anhydrase is now involved. It's in the cytoplasm. It's not membrane bound, and your proton is made again. And you can think of the proton as just recycling, the same proton going around and around and around. But in that reaction, bicarbonate and carbon dioxide, or excuse me, bicarbonate's made. I've also put carbonate here um, for, for a number of reasons. There's an equilibrium and also the transport may involve carbonate. But the way it gets out of the cell is a protein called NBCE1 that our lab and Walter Boron's lab cloned a number of years ago. And this is the protein that gets bicarbonate out of the proximal tubule cell. And the way it works is it transports one sodium ion one bicarbonate ion and a carbonate out of the cell. You can see that the charge does, charges don't add up. There's one and two minus, that's three minus, and one plus, it's two minus. It's actually transporting uh, two minus charges. Uh, it's a so-called electrogenic uh, transporter, and it's actually driven by the uh, membrane potential across this cell. And I can talk about that uh, afterwards if others are more interested. So that's how bicarbonate gets from here to here. Now, these are just two acid-base transporters. There's the, the mammalian genome has a, a large number of acid-base transport families. The NHE family I mentioned, NHE3 on the luminal membrane, there's actually eight members now, and they're in the heart, they're in the brain. They're, there's a whole zoo of these different transporters, and they have different roles in different uh, organs, but they all transport uh, sodium in exchange for a proton. Some people get upset by that. There's so much more sodium than a proton. How can they be equal? And that just has to do with their affinities. The affinity for a proton is orders of magnitude more than a sodium ion. Uh, there's the SLC4 family of bicarbonate transport proteins, 10 of them. We've cloned a number of them. And in general, they transport a sodium with bicarbonate or carbonate. And there's also chloride bicarbonate exchange, which I'll talk about in a little bit in the context of RTA. There's the SLC26 family of chloride bicarbonate exchange. There's 11 members. These are all different genes. Um, some of these are mutated in different diseases. Pendred syndrome and endocrinology, where you get uh, thyroid abnormalities and sensory neural abnormalities. Congenital chloroduria is now known to be due to one of the transporters, DRA. It's SLC26A3. Uh, 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 the proton ATPase, which we'll talk about in the context of distal RTA, actually is. Uh, 
manufactured from 23 different genes. Very complicated uh, uh, nanomachine. And the carbonic anhydrases, there's 15 of them. There isn't just one or two, there's 15. Carbonic anhydrase 9 it seems to be playing a major role in renal cancer. Ari Beldegren can hopefully talk to you about that at some point. But basically, they take water and combine them with carbon dioxide. It's actually more complicated than that, but is really the subject of a different talk. Now, we tend to think of the pH only being 7.4, but actually right now in our bodies, we have multiple compartments all at different pHs. Uh, the extracellular pH is 7.4, but the intracellular pH in most of our cells is 7.15. It's never 7.4. Uh, the lysosomal pH is 5. The pancreatic luminal pH is 8. The stomach, that's a parietal cell, is 1. And the reason these organs are able to maintain these different steady state pHs, or pseudo steady state pHs, they all have a different arrangement and, and type of acid-base transport processes. And those are only some of them on that previous slide. Uh, it would just take too long to show you all of them. So we have these different compartments, and the pH regulation is maintained uh, strictly controlled in, in each of them. Now, the transporters I'm going to talk about today in the context of RTA uh, is NBCE1, uh, which we and Walter Boron had cloned, and you can see it functioning over there. It's, we call it a sodium base cotransporter. Base just means that the base could be bicarbonate or carbonate. Um, but it transports all of these things uh, out of the proximal tubule cell on the blood side, the basolateral membrane. There's another transporter that we'll talk about in the context of distal RTA called AE1. It's a chloride bicarbonate exchanger and transports one bicarbonate ion in exchange for chloride. And these are bidirectional. I'm just showing it in one direction. And then there's our proton ATPase. Um, this is similar but not exactly the same as the F1, F0 uh, proton ATPase or ATP synthase that Paul Boyer here won the Nobel prize for a number of years ago. It actually does the opposite. It uses the proton gradient to, to generate ATP. This takes ATP and splits it into ADP and phosphate and transports a proton from one side of the membrane to the other. So let's start with a, a case now. Uh, this is a 44-year-old uh, female, and her history showed that she was blind since the age of 16. She had bilateral uh, glaucoma, bilateral cataracts, and on history, or an exam, excuse me, she was short. Um, she had bilateral corneal opacities, her teeth were very abnormal, and she had a history of a decreased IQ. This is, this is a real patient. So this is what her eye looked like. This is the cornea, and you see this opacification in the front of the cornea. You can also see you don't see a nice retinal reflex. These are her teeth. And uh, this is her brain. She has calcification of the uh, basal ganglia. Nothing really else was seen. And these are her electrolytes. So of note, um, she had a little pre-renal failure. Her BUM was 30, creatinine 0.7. pH significantly decreased, as was her bicarbonate. And if you do the math, you can see it's a non-GAP metabolic acidosis. Her urine pH, though, was 4.9. So in the presence of this severe systemic acidemia, she's very capable of acidifying her urine. And then uh, when nephrologists came by, they got what's called a fractional excretion of bicarbonate. Fractional excretion of anything uh, means the amount excreted in the urine divided by the amount coming through all your 2 million nephrons. So you take the amount coming out, divided the amount going into the nephron, and you get a ratio and multiply by 100. Normally, for bicarbonate, it's 0.1%. It's extremely low, which conceptually means that you absorb by far the majority of bicarbonate coming through the glomeruli through, at least in part, the processes I showed you before in the proximal tubule. But this person was excreting almost half the bicarbonate coming through the glomeruli, almost half of that box of Armour Hammer baking soda, roughly two moles a day. So what's going on here? Well, this patient uh, has isolated proximal renal tubular acidosis. Uh, it's autosomal recessive in all the patients that have ever been 
seen, and it's now known to be mut uh, due to mutations in NBC1. And it's the only cause of genetic hereditary isolated proximal RTA. There are no other causes. Um, it's occurring in the proximal tubule, and these patients uh, have the luminal processes working, but the basolateral process just stops, so the whole thing just backs up, and the bicarbonate can't be absorbed. So what they have is a problem on the basolateral side. All oh, this is working normally, but they can't get bicarbonate out of the cell. And the reason it doesn't go to zero, you saw the bicarbonate was 11 or 12, is that other segments of the nephron compensate and increase their usually minimal bicarbonate reclamation ability. They upregulate, and that's why it didn't go to zero. Otherwise, it should be zero. So NBCE1 mutations are now known as the cause of isolated proximal renal tubular acidosis. Now, there are a whole slew in the textbooks for the students here of proximal uh, renal tubular acidosis on a genetic basis, but none of them are isolated. They all, most of them cause Fanconi syndrome. So the distinction here is that in these patients, you have nothing else in the proximal tubule defective. All the other transport processes, absorbing phosphate, uric acid, calcium, everything else that goes on is normal. These patients uh, all have other proximal tubule transport reclamation abnormalities, which is uh, an easy clue to distinguish them from, from these patients, plus uh, the extrarenal phenomenology, which I'll show about. Cystinosis is the uh, most common cause of um, Fanconi syndrome. It's a problem with the lysosome transporting cysteine out into the cytoplasm. It's a mutation in the transporter, and cysteine accumulates uh, inside the lysosome and affects the metabolism of the cells. But there, it's a global proximal tubule transport defect. Now, work in my lab uh, with my colleague, Quenching Zhu, has now um, come up with a better picture of what NBC1 looks like. This is still a cartoon. Uh, it doesn't look like this in real life. Uh, it's a topologic uh, image of the protein. Uh, the yellow is the lipid bilayer, and these blue things are the, are the alpha helices, the transmembrane regions of the protein, and it loops in and out like multi-membrane proteins, multi-TM uh, spanning <laughs> membrane proteins do, in and out, in and out, with a long uh, and terminus inside the cell. So this is the cell, this is the outside of the cell, uh, and a C terminus. And there's mutations throughout, and there are different types, missense, nonsense mutations, which is a stock codon, frame shifts, where the frame shifts and you get a bunch of amino acids that don't normally belong there. And all these patients have the phenomenology I showed. Now, <clears throat> this transporter um, that we cloned is also in other tissues. It's throughout the body. It's in astrocytes throughout the brain, and the astrocyte plays a very important role in pH regulation around uh, neurons, uh, keeping both the intracellular and extracellular pH intact, uh, and that may may or may not be the reason for the, their decreased IQ. Uh, NBC1 is also in the cornea. We'll talk about that in a second. And it's essential for maintaining corneal and lens opacity and intraocular pressure, which I won't talk about. Uh, and it's essential, it turns out, for making the enamel on your teeth. You don't have enamel, uh, uh, normal enamel, if you don't have NBC1 functioning normally. So as far as the eye, the opacity in the front of the cornea is called band keratopathy clinically. It's just a descriptive term, but basically it's an opacification of the front of the cornea. Um, if you think about it, every time you blink and open your eyes, you're causing a respiratory alkalosis on the front of your eye, in the, in the tear film on the front of the eye. So the pH is constantly swinging up and down every time you bat your eyelids. Uh, and the cornea has ways of coping with this, because the pH changes can be quite marked. They've been measured by a number of people. Um, what happens here is that the carbon dioxide, so this is the cornea, this is the front of the eye, this is the inside of the eye. Carbon dioxide, there's a gradient for it to go to the outside world. It's 40 millimeters of mercury inside and zero outside, close to zero in the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide is always leaving, which would alkalinize the cornea here in, in red. Uh, and NBCE1 on the endothelial cells actually transports carbonate. Um, I don't have bicarbonate here for a reason. This particular variant only transports carbonate. Uh, but it keeps the pH in the cornea under control, despite the loss of carbon dioxide on an ongoing basis. Uh, 
But if you're missing that, what happens is um, you have the carbon dioxide leaving, but now the pH of the cornea is too high and you get calcium phosphate precipitating. And it's interesting, it only precipitates where um, your eyelids um, don't close, so it's sort of in between in the center. It's not underneath the eyelids that never see the atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide. And people, you know, chelate it with EDTA, there's other treatments for these patients. But they basically, over a few years, um, have a problem with calcium phosphate precipitation. The cataracts they get, uh, NBC1 has also been found to be in the epithelial cells of the lens, and there's no, no science on this at this point in time. But some people think that uh, it's essential for um, keeping aquaporin 1. Aquaporin 1 is a main crystalline protein in the lens uh, functioning normally. And when the pH, um, it's a hypothesis, when the pH is abnormal here, uh, you get cataracts. But there's work to be done here to figure, figure out what's going on. Maybe it has to do with cataracts as we age, people don't know. But again, it plays an important role in the lens. Um, this is some work we did in the NBC1 knockout mouse. You can see this is, this is the wild type, uh, heterozygous. The knockout mouse is smaller. They also get colonic abnormalities. NBC1 is very important in the colon and the mouse, not so much in the human. Um, but you can see their teeth. You don't get, normally uh, mice have this nice reddish um, color on the front of the teeth. To, it's an iron pigment they get. We don't have that. But it's representative of normal enamel. And these are the knockout mice. So like the humans, they're not making enamel normally. I don't know if you can see this at the back, but the white part of the tooth, in case you forgot, is enamel. So you can't make that without NBCE1. And I can go into why that is uh, later for those interested after the talk. Uh, let's look at another patient. Um, this is a five-year-old male uh, who came in with weakness. Uh, on exam, the patient was pale and had a big spleen. Further tests were done, and these are the erythrocytes. And for those of you that are in hematology or going into hematology, there's some abnormal red cells here. In fact, if you look at look at a number of them, they look spherical, like that one. Some of them look spherical, not all of them. Um, but at any rate, that's spherocytosis, or evidence for spherocytosis. And what you're looking at here is calcification within the parenchyma of the kidney. It's actually in the sort of inner medulla the, near the calyces throughout the entire kidney on both sides, and that's what we call nephrocalcinosis. These are not stones within the lumen of the tubules. These are in the tissue themselves. So the patient had spherocytosis and nephrocalcinosis. And when the blood was taken, the patient was hypokalemic. B1 and creatinine are normal. pH was low. Bicarbonate was 10. And the hemoglobin was 4.8. This is another real patient. So hypokalemia in the presence of severe metabolic acidosis. You have to start thinking what's going on. But this time, the urine pH was high. And when we say high, we mean higher than we would intuitively think, given the low bicarbonate. No one has ever done a dose-dependent titration study of what the urine pH should be for every blood bicarbonate. But 7 just seems high. Uh, if it was 6.2 or 6.3, uh, you'd have people on both sides saying it is or it isn't. But 7, clearly, I think everyone would agree, is higher than it would, would be expected. And this patient uh, is now known to have what we call hereditary distal renal tubular acidosis. It's another part of the nephron. Here's our nephron again. And we're in a portion here called the cortical collecting duct. Now, the cortical collecting duct here is a very complex epithelium. It has multiple cell types within the same tubule. And the two that are circled here are called type A intercalated cells. And they can be recognized because they have all these what are called worm-like projections or microplicae. They're not called microvilli, they're called microplicae. And um, they increase the surface area for the transport. If you look here, uh, another one of these cells here and here, these are principal cells, which I won't talk about, but these are cilia, and people now think this is a flow transducer, actually measuring the luminal flow rate. Uh, and when the thing moves, uh, there are mechanical receptors that alter the cell calcium and alter transport that way. But the type A intercalated cells don't have uh, cilia. But they are the culprit uh, in hereditary distal RTA because they are the machinery that acidifies your urine. And we now know 
through studies in our lab and others, how this cell works also. So the way the cell works is on the urine side, there's a proton ATPase, which I'll talk about a little more um, in a minute. And on the basolateral side, there's two proteins. One is called AE1 that I showed before, one of the SLC4 transporters that transports bicarbonate out of the cell and chloride into the cell. The chloride that gets in leaves on KCC4, which is a potassium chloride co-transporter. So the chloride actually recycles, and you're actually getting rid of K bicarbonate in a certain sense. Um, okay, so that's the machinery for how people now think our urine is acidified, and the cell is the type A intercalated cell, uh, predominantly uh, in the cortical collecting duct. And it's this cell now that has problems with some of these transporters that leads to hereditary distal renal tubular acidosis. This particular patient had a problem with AE1, the anion the chloride bicarbonate exchanger AE1, mutations in AE1. Now, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit because what I didn't talk about, uh, and perhaps I'll do so now, is the mechanism of metabolic acidosis in distal RTA. Saying that the patient has a renal acidifying defect is, is not synonymous with understanding why there's a metabolic acidosis because the amount of protons that are secreted by that cell into the lumen is minuscule. You're talking about micromoles a day. It has no contribution to acid-base balance per se. But it does have a major role to play as to the partitioning of ammonium between the renal vein and the urine. The partitioning of 50-50 that I talked about before absolutely requires normal urine acidification. And without it, excess ammonia, in, in this case in particular, excess ammonia that is not getting into the urine, it has to leave somewhere. It leaves the renal vein. And it goes back to the liver, and the liver consumes bicarbonate excessively in the urea cycle. So if someone asks you, what's the mechanism of the metabolic acidosis in my patient with distal RTA, most of the time the answer is excessive hepatic ammonium consumption because of abnormal renal vein urine ammonium partitioning. Okay? But that process of the partitioning does require urinary acidification. Now, AE1 is not just the, the mutation in this particular patient that affected um, type A intercalated cell transport is not just in the kidney. It's also in the red cell, and it turns out it's 60% of all the protein in a red cell membrane. So if you just take a red cell membrane and ask, what's the most prevalent protein by far? It's AE1 and it transports chloride in exchange for bicarbonate. And in the red cell, it's the most important, or it is the mechanism for getting carbon dioxide from the periphery to our lungs. And this can go in both directions. At the tissue, it goes in one direction, and the lungs, it goes as the other. Um, so that's its major role in the body. But it also has another very important role in the red cell, and that is that it attaches to the cytoskeleton. So there's this, this protein sitting in the red cell membrane, but then it attaches to, attaches to the actin skeleton through a number of intermediate proteins, anchorin, uh, spectrin, and others. And when you have AE1 mutated, you cannot have a normal red cell shape uh, in most patients. So it's a cause of hereditary spherocytosis, the same type of thing seen in the, the patient I showed. Uh, it can also cause elliptocytes. There are a whole panoply of descriptive phenomenology seen with AE1 mutations totally separate from AE1 mutations causing uh, distal renal tubular acidosis. We currently think that the transport is by what we call a ping pong model. And you can sort of think of this thing as flipping in and out like this, with a center binding site. And on one side it binds bicarbonate, and on the other it binds chloride, which I try to depict here not so, not so well. But if you think of it in this configuration, this is the outside of the cell, and it picked up a bicarbonate. Then as soon as it does that, it flips, and now the opening is in the bottom of the cell, and it releases the bicarbonate. But when it's released the bicarbonate, there's now an affinity to pick up chloride. And then when it picked up the chloride, it flips again and uh, releases the chloride to the outside, and this just continues. And this thing can transport 50,000 ions a second. So you can't, I can't picture that. But that's the current view as to the transport mechanism of A1. This is independent of its cytoskeletal attachment. And this is work from our lab. Um, this is actually one AE1 molecule at 2.4 uh, nanometer resolution. We'd like to get to 10 times that. 
uh, and really there's no, no features here, but uh, grossly you can see the um, cytoplasmic, a sort of flipped cytoplasmic and the transmembrane region here. And this is actually a dimer, so it's actually two AE1 molecules uh, interacting with each other. And we're now doing X-ray crystallography and also cryo-EM. UCLA has the uh, Creos Titan and the CTSI, which is one of three uh, cryo-EM microscopes in the world that can actually get to atomic resolution of membrane proteins, which is, you know, three or four uh, angstrom's resolution. So we're pretty excited about that. Okay, here's another patient um, who came in with decreased hearing, uh, was small for her uh, height, uh, and was found objectively to have severe bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. And here's her electrolytes. Again, hypokalemia um, with a severe metabolic acidosis. Urine pH again elevated. Calcium was done in this patient, not the other patient. The calcium creatinine ratio was 1.2. The normal is less than 0.2. So the patient also has hypercalcuria and also had nephrocalcinosis like the previous patient. These are the, these are the kidneys, that's the calcification, not as easily, so this is an ultrasound. So back to our now machinery in the type A intercalated cell, this patient was fine as far as A1, but had mutation in the proton ATPase. Now the proton ATPase is an extremely complicated transporter. It actually is made up of 13 totally separate proteins. And this is a cartoon of what it looks like, and the details aren't important. The, the, the concept is it comes from 13 different genes, and all the proteins coming off these genes are assembled to make this little machine work. And basically what it does is it splits ATP uh, and transfers a proton uh, every time it does that into the cell. Um, and there's actually rotations here and sprockets. You know, it looks like a little motor, actually, when those protons are coming off. It's, it's amazing, actually. Similar to Paul Bohr's Nobel Prize, but a little bit different in the details. And this thing is also found in a ton of uh, different uh, compartments. It's the reason lysozymes can acidify. Uh, it's also found in the epididymis. It's very important for the sperm to be acidified uh, for normal fertility. The, the epididymis actually acidifies down to 6.8 in its lumen due to this proton pump. So it's not just in the type A intercalated cell. Osteoclasts resorb bone through this proton pump. It's in the inner ear, and that's why the patients uh, are deaf. It's in the skin and the collecting duct. This patient had a mutation in the B subunit, um, the same mutation. Um, there's two B subunits per molecule, so both of them are mutated. Uh, and it's also uh, in the inner ear. The endolymph in your inner ear has to be acidified to hear normally. Uh, and so these patients tend to have sensory neural hearing loss also. So mutation in the B subunit of the proton pump. Um, no mutations have been found in KCC4, but a paper came out uh, knocking it out in the mouse, and these patients had similar, these mice had similar phenomenology, distal renal tubular acidosis uh, and, and sensory neural hearing loss. So AE1, proton pump okay, but now um, this was defective. And for those of you that would like to discuss it further, this transporter, when it functions normally, is probably the reason patients with distal RTA are hypokalemic. And just lastly, a little bit about the calcium. There's this thought that's been passed down from generations that acidemia causes hypercalcuria and it's coming from bone. That's no longer felt to be the case. It's now felt to be due to the effect of <coughs> intracellular and extracellular pH on this trip channel in the a part of the kidney called the distal convoluted tubule. Um, <coughs> it's one of many trip channels. Trip channels are important for um, a bunch of different sens sensory uh, inputs, mechano, uh, sensory transduction, many different uh, functions in the body. They also are involved with ion transport, and TRPV5 is a calcium channel. And this calcium channel is on the urine side of the distal convoluted tubule, and it's extremely sensitive to pH, uh, both as far as its function and as far as its insertion into the membrane, insertion and retrieval from the membrane, the turnover. Uh, uh, of, the, of the protein in the membrane. And um, to show uh, its importance in hypercalcuria, this is a study done by Blendels in two different groups of mice, um, wild-type mice, 
and knockout mice. So mice where this is, was missing. And basically he had controls and he created two different forms of metabolic acidosis in each group. One by giving ammonium chloride. Remember ammonium chloride causes a metabolic acidosis by consuming bicarbonate in the urea cycle. And acetazolamide which just knocks out proximal tubule bicarbonate reclamation. Um, so two different types of metabolic acidosis. And you can see the control calcium excretion. This happens to be in micromoles per day. The units aren't important. And it increased with ammonium chloride and it increased with acetazolamide. But in the knockout mice, there was no increase in calcium excretion without this calcium channel, despite the same degree of systemic acidemia. So the current thinking is that the hypercalceria that we get in distal RTA um, is due to local effects uh, on the TRIP-V5 channel. And we know that empirically, that not all forms of metabolic acidosis cause hypercalceria. We've known that for 50 years. And yet, people keep saying that the cause of the hypercalceria is from bone. So the story is a little more complicated than that. And I think I'll end there. So thank you very much.